and you. welcome to Freedom Church. Yes. It is so good to see you virtually this morning yes. for church. It's going to be such a great That's Sunday. That's right, it is. And if this is your first time tuning in, you are so welcome. We're so glad you made the choice to join us today. Yes. We're your host today. My name is Tara. And I'm Bren. We are joining you from Nairobi, Kenya, where we are Firestarter leaders. And if you're watching this in a home or a venue or anywhere else in the world, you are so welcome, especially if it's your first time. You are a VIP and we are so glad you joined us. Send us a message, comment in the chat, email us. We want to hear from you. Absolutely. And why not connect with us on social media? You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and stay connected with all the various things that are happening in our Freedom Church movement and to see if there is a location near you. That's right. One of the things that we love here at Freedom Church is community. It is beautiful. It is the way that God has designed us to operate. We're a global church Mm. that meets around the world, many different countries, many different continents. It is fantastic and we absolutely love it. Absolutely. We'd love for you to get involved in community, whatever that looks like for you. You could Mm. join a group, join an event, message us, and we'd love to help you find a way to connect. We're going to watch a video from our media team. They put this creative together in our This Is Us series. Let's take a look. Come on. This is us. We are the reflection of God's divinity. We reflect his divine order on earth. God's thought that he formed and created. With his hands he made and breathed into us. His image and likeness that in him we are. God is love and love is God. We are love and love is us. Alone you fall, together we stand. We stand for unity, love, connection, encouragement, support, laughter, friendship, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, joy and happiness. In turmoil and confusion, grief and sadness, together we walk. This is us. Together we stand. In service, humility and love. With us, you are seen, heard, loved and belong. This is us. Together we journey. Come on, isn't it amazing that we get to do life in community? I love that God has designed us to be the best versions of ourselves when we plug into community. And I love that we have a church which really values and prioritizes that. So I have a challenge for you. This week, take one next step towards community. And I don't know exactly what that looks like for you. Maybe it is, you know, coming to groups for the first time or maybe it's you know asking someone out for a coffee to get to know them a little bit better whatever it is for you take that one next step towards community and I know for us personally it's been such a game changer over the last couple of years having those relationships friendships that support that comes from Mm -hmm. plugging in to a community and really operating the way that God has designed us operate. Yeah, that's right. Community is key. Yes. Now, another way that you can get to know who we are as Freedom Church is through something that we call our DNA. These are our 12 core values that we share across the movement that really make up who we are as individuals and as the body of Christ. And so we'd love to share with you one of those DNA today, and it's one of our favorites. Mm. This DNA is wildfire. Wildfire, come on, we love this one. It is also a game changer. So let me give the description that we have for wildfire. Expressing outwardly the work that God has done inwardly, our faith and love will not be contained. We have a contagious passion for Jesus that is raw, real, and unapologetic. That's right. It's such a great DNA. And so as we head into a time of worship and head over to the worship team, 
Let's bring this wildfire Come passion. Yes. Let's show God how joyful we are to yes. be in His presence today.
something great. God has something great for us already right here where we are. We're seeing God moving. We're seeing God coming and touching people's lives. And when we start a new series, there's always something that we're going to break into. So I want to welcome you to this new series called Into the Promise. We've just journeyed through Exodus. And as you'll know, there's something about what God does in us. He doesn't want to just get us like free and redeemed. He doesn't want us just to stay at the cross. He wants us to walk in the power of the resurrection. There's something about not just being in the waiting room of God, but actually possessing the promise of God. And this is what I've got a complaint for, for us as the church, as the body of Christ, is sometimes we sort of arrive in freedom, but we don't possess the promise. And even right now, I know I'm speaking to people, maybe I'm speaking to you wherever you are now. Maybe you're, you're in a fire starter group, maybe you're in one of our locations, maybe you randomly, but it wasn't so random, picked up this message and God is speaking to you. And right now, I'm going to speak into the promises that are yet unfulfilled in your life. See, there's a prophetic message that is coming that wants to stir the things that are asleep, the promises that are suspended on the vines. He wants to bring you to a place to be able to pull and grasp the fruit, to possess it rather than just see it suspended. For even right now, there is a, 
a moving from sort of suspension to reality. There's a moving of words that have been spoken in the prophetic over your life in the years that have gone by that have only been always in, in sort of out of your grasp. Suddenly it's going to come into your grasp through this series. So you need to listen to what God has to say. Listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Maybe you don't have faith right now, but God has faith for you. <laughs> God is even reaching to you right now, and there is something within this about the greater life that God has you to live. So come on, church. We're going to shift. We're going to move into this, and I'm going to go through quite a few scriptures. Uh, I'm going to teach you some principles. And in fact, what we're going to do is, I'd love to just jump into the promise and talk about the promises. Now, through the Exodus series that we've just come out of, and if you missed it, you need to pick up on it, because there was gold in there. It was all about getting Egypt out of us. And, and, and it's about what happens in the wilderness is so important to how we cross over into the promise. But what I'm going to do in part one is actually cause us to sort of be ready for the transition. See, often we get lost in the transition. And there's a transition of moving from the sort of desert into the promise. This is where many of us struggle. We can see it the other side of the river, but we can't always cross over to possess it. We hear about it and we have moments of faith to believe, but it always seems to evade us. And so I want to talk to you about some things that we can do. So we're still going to like arrive in some of Exodus because I want to move you by the end of this part one ready. So you're ready to cross over into the promise, right? Because otherwise, I just think we talk about the promises when we don't deal with some of the facts. So we're going to do this right now. Do you know what? When uh, Heather and I first got married, we went to Zimbabwe. And uh, th this is now 37 years ago. Wow. And we went there and we were right close. We toured around. We were doing some mission stuff. But we had a chance to go to the Victoria Falls. Wow. And it's one of the most like, wonders of the world. It's like just an absolutely incredible place. We were three hours away. We were so busy with a lot of other stuff. We put it off and never, ever went. Oh. And I see that come up now and then on telly. And I'm there like thinking, what a bad decision. Three hours. Can you imagine if you just said three hours, you can go to this, the most wonderful like, you know, place in the world. I mean, it's just incredible. But we were too preoccupied. And it's something one day we're going to go, right? But, but, but God just showed me this. This is similar for a lot of us. We had something 37 years ago. Maybe seven years ago. Maybe last year. We had something that was like, do you know what? I felt like I, I sort of bypassed. I was so close. I could almost feel the spray of the waterfall on my face. I feel like I've actually been there, but I haven't actually in reality. And yet God wants to make the promise to reality in your life. We can be so close, but so far. So the first point I just want to make is you're on the border of something greater. You've got to realize the declaration of faith. You're on the border of something greater. If you make Jesus your Lord, the greater is always ahead of you. It's calling you. You might have seen some great things, but what is ahead is greater than that which has been. But there is a border. Borders have to be crossed. So there's something about realizing that God is the God of the overflow. He's the God who provides he is faithful. So we're going to go back into Exodus right now. Exodus 33, verse 1 to 3. And this bit of scripture is, is amazing because it's about his promises. This is the original uh, God promising the promised land. So it's like, let's go back here. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. Great word for someone today. You've got to leave this place. You stayed here too long. We're a bunch of settlers when we should be a bunch of climbers. Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. Don't settle. Now go up to the land. Climb to the land. Go up to the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, all, all this time, long ago, because I'm going to give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites. You know the opposition? The giants? Oh, there's an angel involved. Did you know that, that God spoke about this? No one mentions the angel. I'm going to send an angel because God always goes before you. 
You ain't alone. He sends an angel before you. Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Parasites, Hivites, Jebusites, <laughs> Sedulites, all of it. Go up to the land, flow in with milk and honey. So here is the promise. Here is the promise. But I will not go with you because you're a stiff-necked bunch of people and I might destroy you on the way because this was just after they made a golden calf. It's like, I know where you lot are like. If I come... <laughs> but do you know what? I'm going to send an angel before you. It's quite, quite amazing. And then into Exodus 34 you'll see that Moses goes up to the mountain again to get the second Ten Commandments. Because remember, he came down, saw the calf, he smashes them. So this is the second. This is like, talk about a second chance. This is your second chance. But these commands, and, and Rosie said this just recently when she spoke in Exodus, this was the covenant. A covenant is an agreement. And so come, you know, Moses comes down again with the people. You've got to realize that every promise is based on an agreement. We think promises are separate to an agreement. We wonder why God isn't like fulfilling the promise, but sometimes we're not fulfilling the agreement. And willingness precedes that agreement. Can't be made to agree. There's a choice. Then we go into Deuteronomy 1, 21 to 22. Says, see, the Lord is God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it. See, the promise is there. Go and take and possess it. The God of your ancestors, He told you, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Then all of you, listen to this bit. Then all of you lot came to me and said, uh, I know He's given us the promise, and it's all so wonderful, and we've had the description of the angel and the milk and honey and the amazing land, but can we send some men ahead? to spy out the land for us, bring back a report about the route we're to take and the towns we'll come to. They end up agreeing to send, we know, as the 12 spies. I've said this to you before, guys. The 12 spies, this is where it all went wrong because they came with a bad report, was not God's idea. It's man's idea. God will speak promises into your life. But then we negotiate with him to say, do you know what? Perhaps you could give me a glimpse. Perhaps we could like just send some people and check things out. What, what is this based in? It's based in unbelief and doubt. It's saying, can we really trust God? Let's send our own people with their own vision when God's vision wasn't enough. How are you waiting to rely upon your vision to accept what God is saying rather than actually believing what God has said is true? This is so key to grabbing a hold of the promise. If you're going to be a people that will want to send spies to check things out, because that's the safe thing. That's almost like, let's send someone else, and then we'll believe their report. If they never sent the spies and just did what God had called them to do, they would have got there sooner. This is a huge, important truth. Spying is man's idea. And the trouble is when we rely on man's report rather than God's word, it gets us into trouble. It leads us from one year to 40 years. What sometimes we call wisdom is really unbelief. Oh, isn't it wise? We don't all like take all the people, do we? Why don't we just take 12? God, we got some great wisdom going on here. And then Moses joins in the whole thing. Numbers 13, verse 19. He says, can you, okay, spies, if you're going to go, go. And I've got a little list of questions here for you. So he's got some questions. And one of them, this is just a bit. Can you go and check out spies and come back to me? What kind of land do they live in? Right? The giants and those. What, what type of land? Is it good or is it bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they Unwalled or are they fortified? He goes on all these questions. Because again, Moses is asking the wrong questions. What questions are we asking about God's promise when he said, go and possess? He says, don't settle, you need to possess. And we're back here praying. God, some of us are praying. We've been praying for far too long. We're praying saying, give us confirmation, Lord. Send me an angel. Send someone to me to just confirm that message. And he's just saying, go. 
yeah, but Lord, I'd like you know fill out the gaps, the picture. You know, if I can get a bit of the picture, is it good or is it bad? Right. Whenever did we come and question the promises of God and actually say, is it good or is it bad? Wow. And yet this is what we do. Because sometimes when the promises come, it doesn't always look like we expect. God is saying, you've got to go. You've got to move. Don't settle. You've got to go. But we love taking control with questions. And I just want to like use this moment right now to, to just really download something to all of us. I have found in the past, where I got stuck was when I asked the wrong questions. We th- and I've heard this, people say, God's big enough. You can just ask him any questions. If you look at your Bible, that's not quite true. When the people keep asking the wrong questions that are based in unbelief, something happens. There is grace sometimes for us to question in a moment of confusion. We're saying, God, what's going on? Right? But he expects you as a people to come back and say, God, what is your will? What are you saying? I need to pick myself up and I need to move forward to possess the promise. The wrong questions, they got them into trouble. In fact, promises will suffocate or come to life through your statements. What statements are you making that suffocate or bring life to the promises over your life? They are not detached. They are very much apart. Being silent isn't going to help at all. You're going to starve. It will become stagnant. So you've got to realize, am I suffocating or am I bringing life to the suspended promises that are waiting for me to possess? You've got to see how this works. Numbers 13, verse 27, 28, 31. So they came back, the spies, you know, the great idea of man to send 12 spies. They came back, a famous account here. We went into the land which you sent us to, and it did. It flowed with everything that God said. Milk, honey, here's its fruit. So big, two men had to carry the clusters of grapes on a pole because they were just so huge, like footballs. Here is the fruit. It's like it's true. And then here it comes. But the people who live there are powerful and their cities are fortified. They're so large. It's like they're so overwhelmingly impressive. We even saw descendants of Anak, the giants there. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people because they surely are stronger than us. Can you see how the promise is right there? They actually visit the promise. Some of us visited the promise once, maybe for a day. Maybe we touched on the promise of God, saw it for our life. We had a smell of it. We came back with a report. And out of the nature of our statement of doubt, it kept us away from possessing the promise. Here they are, they're coming. God had already prepared them. He said, you know, when you go, there's a bunch of like opposition. There's giants, there's everything, but I'm sending the angel before you. They're talking like no one ever told them. It's like, yeah, we went there. It's full of like milk and honey. It's an incredible place, but there's all these giants and the cities and it's fortified. They came back with a bad report. So man's idea of sending spies ends up in bringing a bad report that everyone begins to doubt that the promise, millions of people were affected by these few people rather than pursuing and just saying, God, we don't understand, but we're still going to obey. Guys, we're so busy trying to understand rather than just obeying what God is calling us to do. Something so powerful in it. So in this first year, you've got to get this, I find this profound. In the first year, this famous, famous historic story God plans and he gives them a view of the promised land. Right? It's not 40 years on and they got lost. He, he let them see it. So let's just look at it this way. He gave them about a year in the desert to get Egypt's thinking out of them. 
That seems pretty good. Do you know what I mean? It's like, we're going we're gonna to like redeem some things, some thinking, some slavery thinking, so I can get you ready to possess the promise. Then he says, right, you need to go and possess it. They say, hey, we want to send some men to have a look. Let's listen to their voice rather than your voice, God. And then they come back with a bad report. They, they come and they bring even the fruit is in their camp. So they've crossed over. They come back and they got the fruit. They say, here it is. It's true. And in that first year, they get chance to walk in the promised land. And yet we always talk about the 40 years they were lost in the desert. I think that word doesn't mean they were really, really lost. They were lost as people. Their purpose was lost. Through the questions they asked. Even the time that God planned, and it mentions this valley of Eshkol. Valley of Eshkol is basically the place of the cluster of grapes, of immense, like, of things you've never seen before. So they come back and they even refer to it, and they see it, they see the power of this. So God doesn't just take them out of season, because out of season you don't see the fruit. He takes them in the prime season time. He shows them this is what you can possess. This is what the land can do. And yet they take it back and say, yeah, but not sure. I think we're going to be overwhelmed. The wrong confession delayed the promise for 40 years. Then you've got Joshua and Caleb, these two, these two. These like troublemakers in the middle of the 12. Here they are, Numbers 14, 8 to 9. He says, hey, by the way, just want to put this in the pot for everyone to think about because they're going to rebel against God again. And he says, if the Lord is pleased with us, and he's basically saying, come on, we're God's people. He will lead us into the land. He's already promised it. He remembers the promise. A land that flows with milk and honey, and he's going to give it to us. But don't rebel. Don't turn against the Lord your God. Don't get fed up and impatient and turn against God. Don't think the promise isn't coming and do your own thing. Don't rebel. Wait, we got to do it. Don't be afraid of the people of the land because, do you know what? They won't devour us. We're going to devour them. I mean, this is fighting talk. This is like these two are coming out and it's like, you're talking about giants. We got an angel that's gone before us. You're talking about a spies report. We got a God who spoke about the promised land. There's something powerful about what God is doing. And he spoke this into our life. He spoke promises over your lives. He was struggling. He showed us. See, we're asking these wrong questions. He says, come on, you're going to go in. Their protection is gone. And the Lord is with us. See, this is the key. The Lord is with us. Can you do the impossible? Yeah, because the Lord is with us. You, may, you send your own spies and do your own stuff. You're on your own. But when you take on the impossible, God is with you. He said, don't be afraid of them. Fear was what stopped them that day. See, we're asking these wrong questions often. Often we're saying to the Lord, why has all this happened to me? Why did that relationship break up? Why did this go wrong and financially end up in a bad place? Why did this health situation happen? We come and we question, though, God, as in out of a desperation of doubt, rather than saying what? God, what do you want to do through it? There's a right question. God, what are you doing right now? God, it feels like things are pretty chaotic right now. It's not, it's not like being unrealistic. It's saying, yeah, we're in, a, we're in a fight right now. Why have you abandoned me? This is what they did all the time in, in the desert. It's like, why have you brought us here just to die? Go on, guys. We've said some of those questions. Why have you saved me? And yet it's so hard living this Christian life. I may as well go back to Egypt. Why? Why, when we should be saying, God, what have you saved me for? What are you doing through this testing room? What are you doing through this situation? What are you building? What is your purpose? Asking the right questions. Think about where the motivation is coming from. And sometimes we can even say, but what about? God, what about this? What about that? But we should be saying... 
Yeah, but if the Lord has said, maybe if the Lord has said, and I love this, all this has happened, but yeah, if the Lord is who he is, if the Lord said this, yeah, but what about all this? So you're pointing to all this, but then it's like, yeah, but if he is who he says he is, and if he has called us, maybe just two of us could make a difference. Are we overwhelmed or will we overwhelm? It's a power of perspective. You asking the wrong questions to the wrong people will get you stuck. Sometimes we're asking life directional questions as a spiritual people to insecure people and wonder why we end up in insecure situations. We're asking spies to give us an indication of our future rather than coming to our Father and asking questions upwards. And some of the faith that you perhaps once had, some of the things you thought, I'm going to dare to believe, and some other Christian came along and said, don't be so like daft. Those things don't happen. I think you need to be a bit more grounded. (laughs) Where are you getting your questions answered? It's going to affect your future. They tasted the fruit of Canaan, the promise. They were that close to glory. Can you imagine being that close? They may as well have been in the North Pole. They were so close to where the promise was. They could cross over, but guys, some of us can be so close to the promise and we can live out the rest of our days and never actually fulfill the promise over our life because we're stuck asking the wrong questions. We're listening to the wrong advice. We're stuck and we may as well be the furthest point away on another planet because you're not going to possess the promise. They were that close that they had it in their hands. They picked the clusters. They brought it back. And yet, do you know what? They ended up being eaten. It was gone. It lasted for a day. God's promises are for eternity. But you need to possess them. This disturbs me. That I could be, you could be, that close to God's absolute best, his promise for your life. And you could smell, touch, taste and grab, but walk away into a place which is called a desert and choose out of unbelief To go and live according to feelings rather than your faith. And then you will live your life really with regret. And almost the frustration of knowing I was born for more. That's why, guys, I want to bring this word because I want, to, I want us to wake us up. I can, we can talk about the promises and we are going to go there. But we just got to realize we can be that close to the promise. And miss the glory of what God has. There are people not in my life right now and in our churches around the world that sort of touched the fruit. (laughs) They helped us carry some of the fruit. And yet just through things and situations and asking the wrong questions and making the wrong statements, have found themselves far from glory. Far from possessing the fruit. Only hearing about the stories of those that are possessing the fruit. They, when I look at the Israelites, they, they were really questioning God, saying, Why has He brought us this far? Why has He brought us here to die by the giants? To die, die by the enemy? Surely we'd be better off staying in Egypt and like dying there. Because surely it's better to die as slaves than die as free men. Is it? Just incredible, they ask these questions. But you see, what Joshua and Caleb were asking, they were saying, surely if God has brought us and gone to the trouble of all of the things in Egypt, to get them out of Egypt, greatest deliverance in history worldwide ever, to get them in a desert, to show them the promised land, to speak the promises of God. Say, I've got a land for you. In fact, I spoke it to all your forefathers. They knew about this land. This was like being spoken for centuries. And here they are. They're on the border of something greater. 
And so what Joshua and Caleb, they had a different perspective. It's like, if God brought us this far and did this much, surely he's going to deliver. Surely he's with us. Surely he's going to see it through. And someone needs to hear that right now. Some of you are thinking, why did he bring me this far? Maybe I may as well turn back. Why did he bring me this far? Am I actually going to make it to the end? God's plan for you, if you pursue him and choose faith, do you know what it is to see you step into the promise, not miss it? He wouldn't have sent his son Jesus for you. He wouldn't have done all of this to save you, to see you fail halfway through. There is not something insufficient or not enough about God. There is something about his promise for your life. And he's saying, come on, come on. I wouldn't have done all this just to see you fail. Is God angry with me? No, come on, he's cheering you on. He's saying, come on, you've got to choose belief that your father believes in you. And there is something so powerful. He's saying, come on, there's greater promise. You're on the border of something greater. Something greater. Wow. We might have some failure, but we've also got some grace. I might have some issues, but I know where the answer comes from. (laughs) God has plans for you, but he's saying, come. Got to move. Guys, the presence of adversity, we call them giants, isn't the problem in your life. You think adversity is like, oh, another tough day. Uh, I don't know, uh, I've got this thing going on in my life right now. I've got this. That is not the issue. It's actually your mindset to adversity is the issue. How you set your mind is the issue of whether you will see it as an opportunity or an impossibility. And this is what God has done all the time. Because they felt like grasshoppers. They came back and said, we feel like grasshoppers when, when they look at us. Joshua and Caleb are saying, Who's the grasshoppers? They're the grasshoppers. We're the giants. <laughs> and they go, it's like, guys, were you on the same spying trip? I, I reckon Josh and Caleb bunked up together in the same tent. Who were you hanging out with? Who were you camping with? Who were you listening to? It's going to affect where you go, guys. The conversations in the deep night. Numbers 13. Verse 32, 33, they said, The land we explore devours those living in it. It devours them. All the people we saw, the great size, we saw the Nephilim. Remember the Nephilim? Ah, yeah, the Nephilim. I mean, crazy bunch. Hello. Half angel, half human. It's like this, like crazy, crazy people. So we saw them. The Nephilim are in the promised land. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Have you noticed the word seemed? We use this word a lot, people. It's, again, the problem with the wrong statement. Lord, it just seems to me. You're asking me, but I don't know if you're going to provide. It seems that if I'm going to follow you, it's going to cost me so much. Yeah, it, it will cost you. But amazing how what things seem, the enemy is so good, it's going, ooh. Now, guys, if you're going to ask snakes questions, they're going to give you snake answers. What, it, what on earth was Eve doing even talking to a snake? How, ma- how many times have you been talking to snakes? <laughs> That's what we seem like grasshoppers. Who have you been talking to? Seem like grasshoppers. Why are you even asking the enemy his opinion of you at all? Some of you are oh, oh, leaving the way. Ooh, I feel a bit overwhelmed. Ooh, it's a bit difficult. Surviving, I'm hanging on. How are you? Ooh, I'm just getting through. That probably talks about where you've been having conversations. What statements you've been making. He's so ready to come and he'll, he'll even appear and use people around you to just voice some little doubts and words and say, really, do you think it's worth it? Do you think you're being asked too much for the kingdom? Ooh. It's to rob the promise. Got to listen up. 
You've got to get your focus ahead. When I do mountain biking, there's this weird thing that when you go along the side, going down a mountain, you've just got to hold on and hope you get to the bottom. <laughs> but when you go sideways around a mountain and there, you've got a, a big drop this side and you've got to go through a small path, there's this weird feeling that if you focus on the drop, it pulls you to the drop. Yeah. And what you do is, that, and I've taken a few friends and they went down, but it was fine. <laughs> It's like when I was there, it's like, where have they gone? Oh, I forgot to tell them, don't look at the, don't look at the drop. What you've got to do, you know what you've got to do? You look ahead. You've got to completely blank out what it looks like to your right. And you've got to focus on what's ahead. When David ran down to the giant, he was blocking out the noise of the fear makers and he was focusing upon the promise within the giant. He wants to bring you through the valley. And you're afraid you're going to fall. And if you focus on what could be, you're going to end up bruised. God is saying, keep your focus because your focus will impact your direction every time. Every time. Your expectation to possess the promise of God, it cannot be without cost. If you want great promises to be fulfilled in your life, they come with great legacy. And if you win a promise without a cost, it will not maintain you in the place you are. Legacy won't be connected, it will only be the experience of a day's grape eating. You decide, do I want to just go and eat grapes and go on holiday or do I want to go and live in the promised land? You can go on vacation for a week once a year and have a great time or you can live in the promised land. But you've got to possess it. If you're going to possess it, nine-tenths of the law of possession. So you've got to possess it. You've got to land in it. You've got to fight for it because you've got to fight for it for the generations to come. That's what this was all about, people. So why didn't God drive out the enemies? I just want to fit, we're going to finish up just in a few minutes. Why didn't God drive out the enemies? Because if I'm saying to you, there are promises there for you, but you're going to have to fight for them. They're going to cost you. You can choose to sit in fear, or you can choose to take faith. Watch out for the statements. The statements will either suffocate or bring life. But do you know what? If you're there and you're coming into the promise, why would God leave all those like giants and the relatives and all the like giants sort of running around like devouring everything I mean that's crazy yeah. Yeah. why why wouldn't he like just maybe tidy up a few help like you know help them go in why do they have fortified cities like Jericho why did they have all this sort of like opposition still left I'm sure we ask that sometimes why do I have to fight some of these things Exodus 23 Verse 29 to 30, God says when he's actually talking about the promise, but I will not drive them out in a single year. Yeah. Oh, it's God's plan. <laughs> because the land would become desolate, unmanaged, and the wild animals would multiply and basically kill you. I will drive them out as little at a time until your population has increased enough to take possession of the land. <laughs> Oh, just transfer this right now into your life. Oh, God, why aren't you doing it all at once? Why haven't you fulfilled all of these things? Why is there a process and a time of me possessed? What did he say to Joshua? Every step you're, you take, you're going to possess. It's steps at a time, steps at a time. Keep possessing, keep moving, keep possessing. And, and we'd like to think, God, can't you do it all for me? He says, no, you're going you're gonna to know what it is to live a life that possesses, takes possession. God's called his people to take dominion. The kingdom of God advances. It's dominion, dominion, dominion. And he's saying, hey, if I did it all in once, it would all be wild because it's so massive. It would be wild, overgrown. You'd have lions and bears and all this, he said. But this is, this is the amazing thing that encourages me. God will use the enemy to farm your land. God has used the enemy to prepare the way for the harvest. God has used the enemy, and he doesn't always realize this. He thinks, oh, we're all settled here. We've got it all sorted. And God says, no, I give possession. 
God, even right now, through maybe some rejection, God has used the enemy to only push you into your direction. God has used some situations, even some people with ambition and pride and questionable ways in your life that felt like they were trying to overwhelm you, but God is saying, I'm just getting them to set up your next step. (laughs) This is to do with the promise, because I'm a promise keeper. (sighs) You got to trust me. The day that David stepped onto the field, it was the giant that gave him the prize. Not his friends, not the army, not the soothsayers. But it was the one that provoked him. Your giants speak of the potential of the promise that's ahead. (laughs) So I've come to learn now, instead of seeing giants and thinking, man, this is a big one. You know, we're gonna, guys, we're gonna have to like overcome this. And there's, I don't know, there's, there's some sort of like hardship, difficulty, there's a fight going on. It's like, wow, we're onto something. We're, what am I saying? I'm saying we're on, we're on the border of something greater. If we as a church didn't have opposition and if we had such a like great time, we're probably in the desert. When you're actually possessing land, when you're going in and saying the kingdom of God is coming, the kingdom of God, who brings the kingdom of God? The violent men take the kingdom of God. The spiritual assault. Because we're going in to advance the kingdom and rescue. These are the promises, promises of God. I just love it. God has got the enemy working on our behalf. Don't be intimidated. Press through. And maybe, understand this, the promise that is delayed in your life is only delayed, it's not denied. Some of us thought that somehow it was denied, but it, and, and this is what this whole word is about, the promise. To get your walk in the promise, I've got to bring life to this. You've got to almost resuscitate some of the promises I'm speaking to you around the world right now. Some of you gave up on it, and they're at home. They're in a book that's sort of written down somewhere. They're in your mind, in your memory, and God today is bringing life, and he's saying, come on, you need to, you need to bring breath to this. It's, the, it's at the power of your statements. God is saying there's a promise that is here. So here in uh, Joshua 14, 11 to 12, Caleb, this is Caleb, uh, 45 years on. So we've had all the terrible report, you know, all went on. 45 years on, they're sort of, here they are. And he says, and they've come into the promised land. So now I've got you in the promised land. That's right where I'm going to leave you, right? We're in the promised land. And here he is, this, this like 85-year-old, right? He's 85. He's saying, I'm still as strong today <laughs> as the day Moses sent me out. When I was that spy of 40 years old, I'm still as strong. <laughs> I'm just as vigorous to go out and do battle now as I was then. Now give me the hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself, you heard that the Anakites, the giants, they lived there and their cities were large and fortified. But, here's a statement, but, but the Lord, (laughs) but the Lord, He's helping me. He's helping you. See, this is the difference. I will drive them out just as he said. Oh, God will drive them out? No, Caleb, 85 years old, saying, I'll drive them out. You let me out. It's like, come on, boys. 85 years old, this unconquerable spirit that is grounded in faith. Because for 45 years, Caleb, he went to bed dreaming grapes. He woke up dreaming grapes. What are you dreaming about? What are you focused on? That will form your desire. That will keep your dream alive. That is the promise keeper here he is you become what you behold 45 years he's got this revelation I'm bigger than any of those giants the hill country talks about is Hebron Hebron is 3,000 feet above sea level and there's there's a big thing to learn right there out of everything like he's asking for the high mountain country it's like he's 85 you think he might want to like go on the level he said I want the hill country 3,000 feet above sea level 
What was the issue that he saw with those that never entered the promise? They had a seeing level. It was all about what they saw and heard and believed. And a lot of us have got a sea level. We're on a level. We're on the ground rather than looking up. We're on the ground rather than on the mountain of God looking and saying, here it comes, here it is. God is asking you right now, why did he say, why did Caleb say, send me, to, give me, give me the hill country. I want to be on the perspective of God. I want to be on the place of God. I want to be on the ground level looking up. I want to be on that level. And he's challenging all of us. Are you living by your feelings? Are you living by what you see and hear? Or are you going to live according to what God's word says over your life? What he said, what he said, that his promises are yes. And that's how I want to finish 2 Corinthians 1.20 famous verse for no matter how many promises God has made do you know what they're yes in Jesus some people need to hear that today no matter how many promises he made they're yes in Jesus choose agreement choose to believe choose faith choose to use statements that bring life to the dream and the promise of God over your life don't ask next questions. Come to God with the right questions. They will bring life and faith. And do you know what? It's time to possess the promise. Because you're on the border of something greater. The grapes are reachable and the giants are defeatable. That's what God has for every one of you. And I want to pray right at the beginning as we finish out right now. I pray that God will stir this in our hearts. There are so many these promises suspended on vines and God is saying come on will you, will you come and take the fruit don't come on holiday come and possess the land so right now church can we close our eyes and I'm, I'm going to ask for a, a quick response before we close out I believe there are dreams there are when I say dreams I'm talking about promises you had a dream for the promise God spoke promises over your life and there have been promises you gave up on you've undersold it maybe you said maybe, you know, maybe that was wrong I got that wrong maybe I missed it maybe there's something there today I believe God wants to breathe life but you, you're going to need to take on board this and go out with a change it's called repentance where we repent we turn around and we say God I'm coming after you all over again and some of us have laid those promises down so I'm asking every location around the world wherever you are if you're by yourself listen to this message it applies to you God is with you in that room in that car that position I want to ask you if this applies to you and somehow your promises have ended up in the desert don't stay across the border of what is greater. God is saying, will you choose today to have faith and say, no longer will I stay at sea level. I'm coming up to the mountain with God. Then right now, I want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you, will you raise your hand so I can see you? Will you raise your hand? So I see there's so many people, so many people that have like been in that place and said, here I was. I want to believe again. I'm believing again. I want to resurrect the promise, breathe life. Even as you raise your hand, you're making a statement. Say, God, I'm reaching to you. Those promises that got battered. Oh, in Jesus' name, come right now, all across the world, in this room, Holy Spirit, I speak life, I breathe life, even to those dry bones of promises. And I say, army, live in Jesus' name. I say, army, come to life. Oh, that the Spirit would come from the four corners of the earth right now, breathe life to the promises, because these are legacy connected. They are legacy. They are here for you. So right now, I break off doubt and discouragement in Jesus name and we rise up and we choose faith and we say sorry Lord I listened and I asked the wrong questions my heart was filled with doubt I walked away I stand but today he's saying it's time to cross over it's time to come up so right now oh Holy Spirit because of the cross because of who you are come right now Jesus your promises are yes in Jesus name right now life life in Jesus name Father, in these coming weeks, ooh, stir up that which is in us. Stir up, even the prophetic, stir it up. 
Ooh, rather than just staying suspended. We grab hold today. And I believe some people just like grabbed hold, grab hold, fight for the fruit, fight for the fruit. Oh, God has called you for this. So in the name of Jesus, oh, I pray for that courage. Even as Joshua said, just be strong, full of courage. Come on, set all over him. He led his people in strength and courage to possess all that God has in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Come on, it's going to be a great series. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. If you've just responded to that message, well done. Let's allow that faith to rise up in us. Let's step into the promised land. Let's yeah. charge Amen. into the promised land and grab hold of all that God has for us. Yeah. What an incredible word. You know, I once heard it said that moments create momentum. So I'm sure for many of us watching, we've just had a moment, you know, mm -hmm. that faith has been stirred up yeah. inside us. Let's allow that to create momentum. Let's see momentum Come this on. week. And one of the main ways that momentum is sustained is through community. Yeah. So remember that challenge from <laughs> earlier on? Do one thing this week that pulls you closer to community. Go to groups, have a coffee with someone, share about you know your reflections on this preach and what just got stirred up inside of you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our God is attracted to movement. That's right. And so as we take that one step to pursue community, yeah. let's also take a moment to reflect on the response time that we've just had. Mm. And if you have responded in this moment, yeah. we would love to hear from you absolutely. and to talk that through with you. That's right. And so if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, YouTube, mm. drop a comment down in the chat and let us know if you responded today. Come on. And if you are watching from anywhere else, flick us an email at hello at freedomchurch.cc and we would love to hear from you. Yes. Church, it has been an incredible Woo! Sunday. It has been. We love to do church together. Yes. And we loved hosting you today. We did. Come on. So come back next Sunday for another awesome church event. That's right. Bye.